The Greenwich Show, brought to you in association with those whose pioneering work launched Greenwich Cablevision in 1972. And welcome to the Greenwich Show, a half-hour look of what's going on in Greenwich. Here's what's coming up in the programme. We salute the country's first ever local TV station. I think it was perhaps revolutionary. At that time, people weren't used to seeing um, that sort of thing on their doorstep, as it were. We look at the much-changing landscape of the Greenwich Peninsula. This site has got international importance and people should know about it. How a Greenwich building relieved London of a bit of a smelly problem. In 1958, the new Houses of Parliament were opened and when the MPs came to do their work, they found that the smell was so awful. One of the borough's community successes. If my senior house wasn't here, the community would be deprived of a good place. And the football club ensuring the beautiful game is enjoyed by all. Meeting new players, having enjoyment of the game at the same time, just enjoy myself. Hello and welcome to the October edition of The Greenwich Show. And thank you very much for all your kind comments about our first show. We asked if any of you had any memories of Greenwich Cablevision, the very first local television in the country. Well, you came up trumps. And in the last month, we visited several people who had great memories of Greenwich Cablevision. Let's have a look what they had to say. I think it was perhaps revolutionary. At that time, people weren't used to seeing um, that sort of thing on their doorstep, as it were. The output was good. And, and the people who worked there, I thought, were very professional. I'm very proud, actually, to have had a tiny part in such a historic venture. These days there are loads of channels to choose from, but back in the 1970s in East Greenwich, TV reception wasn't great. Well, that sparked local television in the form of Greenwich Cablevision, the first in the country. We got our television pictures from this weird idea of a piece of wire that went around 7,000 houses. It was the only way to get to decent television pictures at that time. Reception in East Greenwich was very poor. Shooter's Hill got in the way. So some very clever men put an aerial on a very tall building, got the signal from Crystal Palace to the tall building, and then down by cable and delivered to everybody else's houses. Greenwich Cable Vision began broadcasting from Plumstead High Street on the 3rd of July 1972. It cost 15 pence per week for the service, which included local broadcasting by Greenwich TV people. I think when you look back at Greenwich Cable Vision, I think undoubtedly you have to pay tribute to a man called Morris Townsend, who had the vision. Um, unfortunately, he was probably 30 years ahead of his time. To actually run local programmes was, was a fantastic idea. The, the local TV channel was only on for a couple of hours a day. There was a, a show each evening, which was repeated the following morning. The rest of the time, there was just a clock going around. The, the Cablevision office at 307 Plumstead High Street um, had in its basement an office uh, for the TV station. There was a, a storeroom come workshop. There was a small control room and a studio where stuff was recorded. Um, the actual transmission facilities were on, on the Glyndon Estate in, uh, in what were a couple of converted garages. The studio was very rudimentary, um, egg boxes over all the walls as the only sound um, insulation. With a, a little stage at one end, one camera, um, a window and then there was the control room on the other side. You're probably beginning to think why haven't we shown you any footage? 
unfortunately most of the people we've spoken to have thrown it away. But if we did have it, what would it look like? It was very, very community-based. I mean, there was, there were, you know, lots of community news. They were about local issues. There was one that um, focused on local politics. There was one that focused on sort of local events, um, culture, entertainment. Suddenly, on the local television channel, you were seeing local councillors. Uh, the local MP would come on, and, and it, it did bring it very much into, into our lives. And as ever with these things, everybody has their own story or memory. I ended up at their studios in Plumstead, collected this camera. Unfortunately, no one ever told me how to use it. So when I got to the Bubble Theatre, there they were in mid-rehearsal, which I was supposed to be filming, and uh, I, got, I got sound, but I couldn't get any vision. In terms of you know, BBC and ITV programming at the time, it was probably quite substandard. Um, and it was black and white when, when there was colour. But I always got a feeling that people accepted that because, because of what it was and what it was trying to do. I was a little more successful the second time. And that was interviewing a local artist called George Sherlaw. But on the day that the programme was going to go out, we lost cable vision in our particular area. They arrived and we were, we were explaining that there was a bit of a problem in our area, but we could go down to the studio and watch this programme. And as luck would have it, at that very moment, the signal came back on. I was the presenter, the first thing I'd ever presented in my life. Uh, this was rather stark and revealing black and white TV. And um, I, was, I was shocked because I was looking at the screen and I remember saying out loud, who the hell is that strange bloke who wandered onto the set? And it was me, of course. <laughs> 40 years on, we are still keeping alive the memories of those early Greenwich Cable Vision pioneers. We're now on the, 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 the branches, if you like, of, of those roots. Greenwich Cable Vision helped mould and create um, rather forgotten communities on the eastern side of the borough. Those cable systems were the multi-channel cable television systems of their time. Um, and maybe before their time. What a wonderful trip down memory lane and a fantastic look at Greenwich Cable Vision. A big thank you to all those who contributed. Now, this part of Greenwich has seen some dramatic changes in recent years. The Greenwich Peninsula is being tipped as the new big thing. But what was it like in the past? And what plans do they have for the future? We asked Mary Mills to investigate. Well, here we are in the Greenwich Peninsula and people who watch TV would know it's the centre part of the East Enders map as the credits come up. But they won't know very much about it. It's always been a changing landscape here, but now it's changing more than anything else. The peninsula was an enclosed space. We don't know very much about it before about 1600. That's the Pilot Inn and Ceylon Place Cottages. They're probably the oldest buildings left on the peninsula. They were built as part of a development which started around 1800. On the pub is a sign which says New East Greenwich which is what the um, then developer in 1800 wanted to build. The gas holder was built in the early 1880s by the South Metropolitan Gas Company um, for the new East Greenwich Gas Works, which they were going to build as the most perfect, most wonderful gas works that ever was. So to a certain extent, it's a modern movement building. It was one of two gas holders, and together they made up the biggest amount of gas storage that ever was. This gas holder which remains, East Greenwich number one, was for a long time the biggest in the world. This is Enderby Wharf, the place where submarine underwater cables were made which pushed the internet round the world under the sea. It was from there that the Atlantic Cable was taken by Great Eastern, Brunel's Great Eastern, um, and the successful cable laid to America. 
which changed the world. I mean, this is talking about a revolution, really, a revolution in communication. Right beside me is a repeater, which is one of the things made on this site, which took the signals, the electronic signals around the world. Arguably, without the cables and the technologies that were developed on this site, we either wouldn't have had the internet yet, it would be some years away, and it perhaps wouldn't be so efficient. It's a tale of great heroism and great importance for the way the world works now. Enormous changes are going on. The landscape is going to be totally different in a few years' time. What I hope is that we can have some recognition of the heritage of the area at the same time as all the shiny new buildings. They're good in themselves, but we need a bit of everything. What a great look at the past and future of the Greenwich Peninsula. And a big thank you to Mary for her expert knowledge. Well, coming up next on the show, we visit a 150-year-old pumping station and a very special football club here in the borough. I love Greenwich because it has this fantastic sense of history. It's also very modern and the people here are just modern. You're watching an owl, now a jellyfish, and there's his friend. Many others are looking at this too, but they could be looking at your business. Advertise with The Greenwich Show and put your business in front of a captive audience of residents and tourists. Check out thegreenwichshow.co.uk Oh, and there's a butterfly. We love Greenwich because, because of the weather. weather. <laughs> it's amazing. Welcome back to the October edition of the Greenwich Show. We always enjoy receiving your ideas, suggestions for the next show. If you'd like to get in touch, this is how you do it. Email us info at thegreenwichshow.co.uk or you can contact us through social media or you can find all these details on the website. Many of your suggestions have been about community. One such community project is Mycenae House. We sent our cameras for a sneak peek. Hello, I'm the manager of Mycenae House, a community venue based in Greenwich and close to Blackheath. Mycenae House is a 1930s building that was built as a convent and for the last 20 years has been a community centre. It's now a community venue with a broader programme. It's not just about the spaces for hire, it's also about what we can do and provide for the community. And one of the big things that we do is provide our cultural programme. There's now uh, 23 rooms which are used for a whole range of things, for all forms of uh, sport and uh, healthy living activities, a lot of training. We have a wide range of programmes that's aimed at families and young people and older people from uh, unborn babies with mums with bumps all the way through to, uh, to the senior citizens. About 120 things happen each week or on an average week here that people can come along to. Well this is our main hall, this is where lots of the activities take place. We have our comedy club once a month in here, we have the jazz club, the community cinemas in here, but it's also a very popular space for hire. A lot of people hire it for parties, weddings uh, and all sorts of uh, occasions. My CD house is one of those community halls which you, which you won't find um, anywhere um, in London. It's more of a, of a family. All the businesses work together. We have a number of, us, of the groups that operate out of my CD house who come and actually teach our children, which is, I think it, it's brilliant. You won't get that with other community centres. Hello, um, I'm Dave Silk. I run the My Senior Jazz Nights. They're currently the second Friday of the month. We've always had a core of very good musicians and a core of very nice people and a core of very good players and, and uh, a big overlap. What we do here, we encourage anyone at any level to play at any level, providing they try their best. We're not judgmental, so we've got a reputation for living dangerously. Dave uh, is central to the success of the Jazz Club 
uh, over many years here and attracts a great deal of fantastic musicians to the centre and we're very grateful for his kind of patronage of the centre. Uh, in fact, he introduced us to, to Terry Grant, who now runs the, the community cinema. I mean, when we first started two years ago, no one spoke to each other. Now, they come into the bar beforehand, go and see the film, come out, and about half of them stay behind afterwards and discuss the film. And that generates a community spirit. Some people just walk in off the street and they're totally unprepared for a cinema being in a place like this. And you see them come back the next week to actually watch a film. It's lovely. One of the best parts about my senior house is its garden. It's a fantastic space. It's a place of uh, significance for its wildlife and it's for its conservation. But it's also a great event space. We have a lot of things that happen out here. We run our own festival here in the summer. We have a lot of uh, cultural events and, and uh, community events like fates. So it's a very popular place. We used to come out here and they could just run about, explore and go off on adventures. My training is in architectural glass. Um, I'm self-taught mostly and then I went to do a degree which was why I stopped doing play work here. If my senior house wasn't here, the community would be deprived of uh, look at all these people here and just enjoying the garden. It's a good place for the community. I personally was attracted to come and work here because I think it's got a very special atmosphere to it. It's open, it's welcoming, it's an intrinsic part of the community and it seems to be growing day by day. We like to think it's a, a community hub central to the, the vibrancy and health of our, of our community in Blackheath. For our history feature this month, we went along to an extraordinary Romanesque building, just a stone's throw from Abbey Wood. Next year, she celebrates her 150th birthday. She is, of course, the amazing Crossness Pumping Station. We're now at um, the Victorian pumping station at Crossness. It's in what we call Abbey Wood area nowadays. So the sewage from the whole of South London um, was discharged down to here. Well, we go back to uh, 1865, that's the year this uh, building was opened. It was uh, a man called Driver who designed a lot of the work, in particular the cast iron work. And that was a time of pride in, uh, in the empire. The British Empire was everything. Uh, the Brits, well, we thought we ruled the world in, in those days. And there was a lot of pride, particularly about the prowess of our engineers and, and designers and project managers. And it's because they could do it. And they had enough money left in the pot to create this uh, beautiful um, environment um, for the workers to work and visitors to see. In 1858, the new Houses of Parliament were opened and when the MPs came to do their work, they found that the smell was so awful that they couldn't work anymore. It was the smell of sewage coming in. It was called the Great Stink. Um, the newspapers latched onto this because the MPs were complaining so much. The sewage arrived, it depended on the tide. If the tide was going out, it went straight out to sea for the benefit of our friends in Belgium and Holland, of course. But if the tide was coming in, there was a problem because if they were to discharge it straight into the river, then the force of the incoming tide would send it back up to London and the MPs didn't want that. So the solution that uh, Bazalgette came up with was to build a great big reservoir and so he lifted the sewage from when it arrived waiting for the tide to turn after about six or seven hours and when the tide was right it's flowing out again it would be discharged from the reservoir by gravity um, into the river. A beam engine is um, it's a steam engine, it's a rudimentary steam engine. 
it has a, a, a one end some steam cylinders which we can see see here and there's a lot of power in that so it moves uh, a piston up and down which operates a beam engine and that tends to rock so that power then can then be taken some is sent to the flywheel and that's to create a smooth motion in the beam because if we just relied on this up and down motion of the steam it would go donk 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 and it wouldn't be smooth we needed it to be smooth to operate pumps so it'll be our 150th anniversary next year in 2015 and we'll be celebrating that we're hoping that that'll be um, the start of our new exhibition and our conversion into a museum at the moment we open um, in general five days a year on Sundays. The details of our opening days can be found on our website which is crossness.org.uk Crossness Pumping Station. What a fascinating building and well worth a visit. Now time for the Greenwich Show's our very own Greenwich Guide. There's so much to do in Greenwich this month. Here's our pick of top events that we think that you should pop along to this October. On Sunday the 12th of October, Woodlands Farm Trust is holding an Apple Day, an opportunity to sample and buy many different types of British apples. There will be a variety of activities including crafts there too, a treasure hunt and apple pressing. Stores will be selling local produce. Entry is free but donations are welcome. A new regular show begins at the Blackheath Halls on the 18th of October featuring Arthur Smith with comedy, music, magic, theatre and more. This new variety show promises to be a fantastic night. On Saturday, October the 11th, between 2 and 4, Christchurch Shooters Hill have a tabletop sale of new and nearly new children's clothes. The money raised by the fundraising committee will go towards plans to fix the heating system and a new church hall and community space. For more details, go to ccshootershill.org.uk. The Woolwich Singers continue to meet every Wednesday for Feel Good Singing. They ask you to join them whether you can sing or not. Their weekly subs include a drink and often homemade cakes. These are Wednesdays 6.30 to 8 at Clockhouse Community Centre in Woolwich, South East 18, 5QL. Or, if dancing is more your thing, after a great night at the Trafalgar in July, 70s and 80s night Haven't Stopped Dancing Yet returns on the 1st of November. The 70s and 80s Soul, Funk and Disco Night is in the upstairs ballroom at the Trafalgar Tavern for people who remember the tunes the first time round and will have a distinctly Halloween flavour. There's more info at haven'tstoppedancingyet.co.uk And on October the 29th, we at Greenwich Mums are holding a Market Mums Autumn Spook Out. Join us for a hauntingly good Market Mums in this half term as we support local parent-owned businesses as they trade in our famous market. There'll be entertainment to keep your little horrors happy, which will include Halloween-inspired dance, theatre and book readings. More details can be found at GreenwichMums.com. So that's our roundup of events for this October. If you've got an event that you'd like us to feature, please send us all the details and photos and video, if you have it, to info at thegreenwichshow.co.uk. As we said in our first programme, we want to feature the films and work of people of the borough. This month we're featuring a film of South London Special League, a charity that's celebrating its 10th birthday, and they're based in Shooters Hill. From 2004 till now, one beautiful journey. There was a big gap 10 years ago. There was very few opportunities for young people and adults with disabilities to take part. When I first started, it was very little and few. And within a year or so, it just got bigger and bigger and better. I've been coming for over 10 years. After an initial bit of funding, it's grown massively, so people come from all over now. I travel from St John's Wood. I'm one of the longest serving players here for the past eight years. I've been doing power chair football for eight years. For two to three years. About ten years. I used to come solo and I used to be put into different teams that needed an extra player. Some of us, you know, haven't got out of playing opportunities outside of training sessions. I probably wouldn't be doing much, probably just sit at home and watch telly. More or less keeping myself out. 
to me, football means everything really. It's so something to look forward to once every month for me, that's definitely what I put first on my calendar. Somewhere to play regular every month and just keep my mind active for what I'm enjoying and like loving to do. When I started, I weren't very good. I was no way confident. I crashed into the wall and everything. But now I can actually control my chair and I'm part of the team, so. This chair is what I use. The joystick is how I drive. And then this bumper is how we hit the ball. You touch it to one side and then you take it back to the other, so you're like really quick manoeuvres. Like, it took me a while to get to grips with it, but when I did, I fell in love with it, and now I just want to get better and better. They want to challenge more. They like those little challenges. Um, they work better as a team. Playing football like this is a chance to try out their skills, to test themselves, to meet other people. It means quite a lot because I get to socialise with all my friends and I can do stuff that normal kids can't do. Meeting new players, having enjoyment of the game at the same time. Just enjoying myself. Friendship and exercising. Even though we may fight, have jokes sometimes, we all know at the end of the day we're one team. So many familiar faces and characters, so we um, really feel you're getting supported. These guys here are my family, so. The special thing for me is that I can play a team sport and like feel great about it. Like I know I'm good at something. We trust, they deliver. That gives them their confidence. That's where you get lovely results. This is what football gives me. It gives everyone with a disability a level playing field. We do well, sometimes we do bad, but it's all part, parcel of the game in how we play. It's clear none of this would have happened without Sharon. She's rallied people around to help her, but without her giving up lots of things, I don't think it would have happened. I thought I had a lot of go in me. She beats it. But she's, you know, won awards. She's gone so far beyond what's normally expected. Just a huge amount of passion and enthusiasm and all about getting the results for the young people and the adults. We know without her, like, this wouldn't be happening for us. It's just fantastic cool. Yeah! It's a lovely life. Well, that's it for this month's The Greenwich Show. Our next show will be on November the 3rd. So if you'd like to get in touch, here are the details. The best place to find out all about The Greenwich Show is our website, thegreenwichshow.co.uk. You'll find all the details on there. The Greenwich Show, brought to you in association with those whose pioneering work launched Greenwich Cablevision in 1972.